Welcome everyone to RSD, RSD 13, Rivers of Conversations, Rivers of Conversations Around Systems Thinking. This is the online portion, which, um, you know, where we have different conversations that are all in the theme of systems thinking uh, today. So this is the final session today, uh, Monday, October 21st. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to host. Um, I'm I'm what is considered a river guide, so that means I'm guiding some of the conversations today. But it also happened to play double duty because I have been recently hosting some of these systems thinking Ontario sessions. So um, we were super delighted that RSG reached out and said, "Hey, if you stick to your consistent timing and your consistent Monday, it happens to overlap or run concurrently with RSD. Can we feature you all?" And we said, "Certainly." Uh, so that's why this session is on RSD, on the RSD platform. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you to the team. Um, so this one is called uh, Systems Convening, like a retrospective, introspective, and prospective. Uh, but essentially, we're going to be talking about this, this meetup that has been running for a number of years called Systems Thinking Ontario. There's a couple of folks on the, on the call here today that have been around in, in, in and around this community for quite a number of years. I myself don't have the same longevity as they do. Um, and as I call them up or throw up some priming questions to get us started, maybe they can introduce themselves a little bit. Actually, we're, you know, you know what? we're a small crew. I'm going to do the typical systems thinking Ontario fashion uh, to go around the room and introduce ourselves because we have the time and we have the size to do that. So. Why don't I call out your names on my screen? You can um, sh just tell us who you are and tell us what brought you here today. Um, Jessica? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jessica. Um, I um, uh, came across Systems Thinking Ontario um, uh, quite a few years back, and I sort of lost touch And um, when I went away. Um, I went for school during the COVID time, and uh, now I'm actually currently in um, Massachusetts um, at the Conway School of Design for a, a master program on ecological design. And so um, I have a little bit of a um, background in, in information systems um, from the system engineering perspective, um, and uh, been interested in many different things, and so have a lot, quite a few waypoints, and uh, really appreciate the time that I was able to participate um, in person at the System Thinking Ontario meetings at OCAT um, for a period of time, and that sort of fueled me to, into um, taking even a, a windier route <laughs> um, to where I am at the moment. So I'm um, still currently still learning and um, um, just thought um, it would be great to to touch base again and see um, how things are. And so, so here I'm back. So. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And yeah, we'll touch on the, the benefits of in-person and virtual and maybe we'll reflect on that as well. Um, yeah, Angel C. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Angelcia, and I'm here in Calgary, Alberta. I'm familiar with some of the systems work done with the Alberta Energy Department of Energy, and I think that was led by Alex Ryan, who is now in Toronto. So I was interested um, in what the systems thinking community was doing in Ontario. Wonderful, and thank you for the clarification, and Angelcia. Thank you. No worries. Thanks so much. Um, David Hawk. David, I'll just get you to unmute and then you can. Okay, now can you hear me? We're good. Um, I do have a relationship, I guess, to the system science people. Um, my major work is in the area of what's increasingly called climate change, which I began back in 75 and worked with some of the uh, ostensibly leaders of system science from the 50s, 60s, 70s of the time, and then did this work, which uh, the first book that I produced from it was in 79, which uh, 
was okay, except uh, uh, heavily rejected. Uh, the dean of my school, which it was a PhD for that school, rejected it almost violently and wanted to make sure that I never got a PhD for working on client, climate change and went on and on for another year or two, but finally it passed. Anyway, I've continued since that time writing a number of books. Uh, that 79 book was republished, I guess, what, 40 years later in 2019. And that book uh, since became popular with the American vice president. And so she has chatted with me a time or two about it. And she had it placed in the Library of Congress as an example of, of how bad off we are. And uh, in our conversation, she wanted to talk about the follow-up book, but since it has a swear word in the title, she says she's not allowed to mention that book because we're being taped and she's not allowed to say things like that. But anyway, that book <laughs> uh, last summer went off to the Philippine Book Festival and won an award because it's outside the US and that word's okay. Uh, recently I went to the uh, Frankfurt uh, Book Festival and again won an award and about 50 people there wrote reviews of that book. Uh, again, since it wasn't in America, that word was okay. <laughs> and so now I'm reading through uh, their discussion, their reviews, can things really be as bad as I say uh, they look pretty bad with that book that got republished in 2019 as uh, Too Early, Too Late, Now What?, which is the one the vice president put in the Library of Congress. Uh, but now, this book is much clearer uh, that came out in December. And currently, I'm just ready to publish a third book, which is even clearer without swear words in the title. Thanks. And so I'm turning old and wimpy. But nonetheless, it all comes out of system science work. And David Ng has been along a good share of this work. And uh, yes, 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 and appreciate David's existence. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David Hawk. Um, appreciate that. So yeah, maybe just uh, Cheryl May, just briefly introduce yourself and what brought you here this evening or this time of day, wherever it is. Yeah, it's um, a weird color, aren't I? I'm sort of strange color. Um, <laughs> it's just coming evening here. I'm in Toronto. You're in Toronto, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I'm one of the uh, RSD 13 organizers, along with Angelsia, uh, who does the newsletter. And um, yeah, I, I, this is my, I think this is my 50th session in nine days. So I'm not in, incredibly coherent, but um, wanted to join you. I haven't joined many systems thinking Ontario meetings over the years, and I've always wanted to. So here I am. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Perrin, if I'm pronouncing that. Yep, that's right. Hi. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I'm Perrin. Um, I don't have my lights on right now. Um, so I study sustainability, complexity, and um, and I've spoken with David Ng about his work in the past. I'm a little bit familiar about um, what you guys do here, and I've um, been hanging out as in the RSD 13 conference, and so um, you know, just wanted to hear a little bit more about what this group is doing. Wonderful, thank you. And um, for the last, the last folks I'll call on are closer to the to the longevity of this meetup. Um, so you don't have to share all your background. We'll get into that in the conversation, but just briefly, you can share your name, where you're calling in from, and what brought you here this evening. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Okamura. Hi. I'm Kelly Okamira. I'm uh, based in downtown Toronto. Um, and I've been with Systems Thinking Ontario for a long while. <laughs> I don't know. What else do you want me to say right now? That's good. That's good. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Tim L. Uh, Tim here. I'm in Toronto as well. Um, and uh, I'm here because I'll just say originally, Elena probably is the person who connected me in with with the event or the the, the systems thinking Ontario that, that got me to 
get going. And then it was really kind of a meaningful kind of a time when when at some points I helped organize. So I really enjoyed it a lot. And so even though I haven't been as active recently, it's uh, significant enough that I wanted to show up today. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Elena? Uh, yeah, um, I have been active in the systems field for probably around 40 years now. Um, since, um, since Barry Clemson introduced me to the field of cybernetics back at grad, in grad school, um, I ended up, um, uh, partnering with Stafford Beer and have been mainly using his models of viable system model and the team's integrity process, but also have been very interested in using those, um, with respect to sustainability issues. Um, and also with respect to um, just, you know, helping nonprofits be able to um, to manage things better, which, you know, quite often they have a real problem with. Um, I've been active in a number of the societies, particularly the American Society for Cybernetics, uh, the International Society for System Science and Metaforum, which is the one devoted to Stafford's work and extending it. And I've been very happy to have a local group, um, Systems Thinking Ontario, and to have an opportunity to engage usually at least once a month. So happy about that. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, we're happy to have you and we'll, we'll chat more about that. Um, last but not least, David Ng. Uh, thanks. Here in Toronto. Um... I'll, I'll actually introduce myself by way of uh, how I got into this particular um, event. Um, it actually dates back to, uh, I was working at IBM, probably would be around 2008. And uh, Peter Jones had just moved to Toronto. He joined the faculty and I do a lot of blogging. And um, and so he actually sent me an email note and said, I noticed that you um, come to Toronto quite often. Could you please, you know, uh, can we meet sometime when you live when you're actually in town? And I said I live in Toronto. I just travel a lot, and so that was kind of the beginning of the uh, relationship with Peter, um, who's at the foundation of starting uh, System Thinking Ontario as an outgrowth of Design with Dialogue. Um, and so uh, Peter, unfortunately, is uh, time zone deprived right now, so uh, he won't be joining us today. Thank you for starting us off, David. Yeah, so so the four here, uh, David, Elena, Tim, and Kelly, have a long relationship with this. So we can all casually chat about it, but I'll get us started and weave some of the conversation about the history of this meetup, how it started, and what's its value, what's its importance. I'll start that by sharing something, actually. So this is the homepage uh, that David Ng manages of Systems Thinking. And if I'm to scroll down... Actually, this meeting is described as the 125th meeting. So if I scroll down the left thing, I go all the way. Oh, my God. Keep scrolling. Oh, my God. Still not there. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we're at 20, 2012, which doesn't have that much. And then David and Elena told me 2013, January 17th was the first official one. So starting here, <laughs> maybe David and or Elena, you can both kind of share what was the genesis of this meetup? How did it start? Um, why did it, why did it come into existence? Can you maybe share a little bit of background about this? Elena, I think you actually were going to design with dialogue meetings before I did. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember. What I do remember is you and I having a conversation in Crete, um, long before this started, and saying. You know, why do we only run into each other halfway around the world when we both live in Toronto? And that and we kind of kicked around the idea and realized that there were probably at least half a dozen folks in Toronto that come to these to the other systems meetings. Um, I think Stephen Davies was certainly one of them. Um and I'm trying to remember who the other one was, but but certainly Judith Rosen, who's based in Rochester, was among that group. And I remember one time she came and we went out for brunch. And that was when we started thinking that we really needed to have a systems thinking group here. And and what were some of those systems, existing systems groups, Elena, that were already 
gathering? Uh, not necessarily here in Toronto, but okay. it was the American Society for Cybernetics and the International Society for System Science and the British Cybernetic Society, which they just call the Cybernetic Society. Um, and there were also uh, um, UK systems uh, group and SCIO, which is another UK group that sometimes had people that kind of floated in and out of the city on travel. Um, and we also had quite a good group here when we had the RSD in Toronto last time. And I remember Paul Pangaro um, was one of the featured speakers and we were doing it in the Mars Center, which was an excellent venue. Right, right. David, any any memories or any recollection about the early days of starting up this meetup? And so, so there there there's some history that precedes this. And so, in 2000, the World Congress on System Sciences was held at Ryerson. Uh, that was an ISSS meeting, um, and um, and so Elena and I were both at that uh, ASC meeting in 2003, I believe, was at Ryerson in Toronto. Is that right, Elena? Yeah. 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 And so, so I attended that. Um, and then um, uh, between the ASC meetings and the ISSS meetings, there were also meetings in Europe from the International Federation for Systems Research. And so we'd end up going to Austria for meetings. And so that was a running joke that I could, I could bike to see Elena, but I have to get on a plane to see her at a systems conference. Um, then the, the, uh, we actually started a meetup group um, coming up to the ISSS Waterloo 2010 meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we're meeting monthly. At that point, we're actually meeting um, at a pub on uh, Danforth. Uh, we hadn't quite affiliated then with uh, with OCAD. Um, and uh, the people like that. Um, one thing I didn't like about Meetup is that after uh, you, you leave a Meetup, you stop paying for the Meetup, it disappears from the web, which is why, yeah. uh, why we're on Google. Um, on Google Sites and and uh, having the way that we've uh, been announcing these meetings and using the technology that way, so uh, I had started attending the Design with Dialogue sessions that uh, Peter had. Uh, so he would have monthly meetings in person, um, and the facilitation was among designers learning facilitation techniques, and it'd be a different technique every month. And so uh, Stephen Salad is an example. Um, I was at one of his sessions and. Uh, again, the body movement, these sorts of things, different approaches. And um, in the discussions, uh, we end up having um, questions about uh, about which which techniques, which methods would go together. And I guess Peter was also at that point teaching, um, uh, he was teaching the uh, systems classes at in OCAD-U in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. So the question came, could we have discussions about systems and systems theory? Uh, because the uh, DWD was much more about methods. And um, we'd start the discussions about having, um, uh, about approaching systems. Um, but the question was, how should we actually do that? And uh, Peter's tradition was to, to always meet in a circle. Uh, and um, you have check in, check out, and he has these protocols. And we more or less um, copied them over into System Thinking Ontario. Um, the difference was that the way that we originally started the meetings was about it was centered on readings um, and trying to resurface a lot of the old systems ideas. Um, and uh, the original intent was that uh, people, we, we we can't really expect people to always do the readings. Um, we try to get readings that were not, um, that didn't require a university library access. And so people could look at them if they didn't, but we didn't assume that people would. Um, but we would have uh, a structure. Um, this is based off um, in, in the... In the DWD in January 2012, I ran a session on the meta design of inquiring systems. And, and the question was, how is it you actually organize um, creating knowledge in groups of people? And so there's, um, there's, well, we can go through the slides here. So the, the question about what do you know about what you don't know? And there's the idea of ignorance. 
and you get into the um, known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and 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 how you might learn about that. But this leads you towards the idea of an inquiring system where you might sweep in new knowledge. And so the idea was that everyone would learn about uh, whatever topic it would be uh, at their own pace uh, with whatever knowledge they had. Uh, the conversations were quite important um, that uh, the assumption would be that uh, if you didn't know, it's like, it's not your fault. You didn't know, like, we'll just talk about it. And I also was making this claim with a lot of uh, systems work, people tend to gravitate to the library and say, oh, I need to read more. I need to read more. And I was saying, well, reading more actually doesn't help that much. It helps a little bit, but it's actually much more important to have discussions and questions and answers in a group. And so the structure originally was that we would have a, uh, a reviewer of a paper, um, and then we would have a discussant uh, who would talk about it. And that would start off a conversation between two people that would expand the group and people go, oh, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And so uh, one of the ones that was actually interesting and Lenny can comment on this one was um, uh, Stafford Beer had done a Massey lecture and so the recording was available. And so we actually had a session on that. Do you want to talk about that one a little bit, Elena? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of what he did in that Massey lecture, which was called Designing Freedom, um, sounded a little bit archaic. And one of the things I remember was that people, some people focused on this kind of more technocratic language and kind of didn't get that he was it considered pretty much of a left-wing rebel, uh, partly because of his work in Chile, but also because of his general stance. Um, but yeah, I think we had we had some interesting things, interesting discussions on that, and also that's one of the things that CBC maintains. So anybody that wants to listen to it or read it can download that one for free. Um, one of the other things I remember, I think it was from before we actually started, was Anatole Rappaport giving a talk at, at Allen's Pub on the Danforth. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty memorable. And another paper I remember that I think I was one of the lead discussion people on it was the McCullough and Pitts um, topology of nervous nets about the non-transitivity of any choices that involve um, pairs of, of two out of three, like rock, paper, scissors. And I thought that was an interesting thing for us to explore. That was quite a short paper, but I think a paper with a lot of profound implications. I think that's a very helpful kind of picture of history and some historical threads that you've woven together, David and Elena. And and some of the themes that are coming out for me is one is just the ability to meet to meet folks who you know locally, but as you're mentioning, you don't get a chance to see them as often as you like, or you only see them on the circuit out in out in Austria or around the world. And another was about having a different pace of being able to have conversations versus uh, you know reading more, only going after reading. So I think those are two themes that to me are coming out. But I want to bring um, Kelly into the conversation as someone who's been along long-time attendee. Kelly, can you share a little bit about design with dialogue? Because I know you were there, you've been a part of that, and how that created the offspin of Systems Thinking Ontario and your experience going from one to the other, or being in both for a period of time as well. Uh, thanks, Ed, because that, that that's always my intro, is, is that I came from design with dialogue. Um, I, I, followed, I followed Peter Jones in terms of um, some some of the sessions that he was doing. And one of the workshops that I gave for Design with Dialogue, uh, that's how I met David Ng. And David came to the workshop and he said to me, you don't understand systems. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'm chasing, uh, I'm chasing how to make new products for a finite planet. And if you can give me the answer through systems, I'll follow you. Uh, I didn't know when I agreed to uh, be part of his research project that it was a 10 year project, but I certainly can appreciate how, uh, how 
much structure or at least I, I don't sound like it, but um, having a ha having more verbiage or confidence in terms of some of the uh, ways that I might look at a situation through a systems lens. I, I appreciate what David said, but I also uh, really appreciate what Elena said, that you don't have the academics of science, the science of systems, but you, it's probably from a learned experience. Right. So yours was more experience-based. This was a way, Kelly, for you to deepen your knowledge and learnings of system, but not having to go the academic or classroom route, but really embrace this conversational route. Is that correct? That That's right. I, I, I think that I uh, diverted from the academics and went direct to the experts. Gotcha. So I, uh, you know, uh, in addition to David and Elena, uh, David Hawk is on the call and I, um, I, I greatly appreciate my time spent with David Hawk, as well as the late um, Ian Mitrov and uh, other people that, that have been introduced to me through this, uh, through this group. I noticed, thank you, Kelly. I noticed we also have Stephen Sillett on the call. Stephen, I'm not oh. sure if you're Did listening you possibly or you're available, but you also played a role in co-organizing Design with Dialogue. And I just wonder if you had any reflections on opening that up to System Thinking Ontario as well. He might be, we'll come back to him. He might be stepped away. He might've logged in and just stepped away, but that's okay. Um, another person I'll bring in is, is Tim, Tim Lloyd. Tim, maybe you can share your introduction to both the, the field of systems and how you connected with the folks around Systems Thinking Ontario and any insights into your role in even organizing some sessions. Do you look for subjects? Do you look for people who are coming through town? How do you kind of like bring everyone together or host different sessions? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for me, it was, I think cybernetics is what kind of caught my imagination, which someone I think recommended speaking with Elena. That was the first person I sort of reached out to that connected me in with systems thinking. And then I attended for a long period of time, just learning and participating and really enjoyed uh, the discussions and the format when David reminded us or reminded me of the circle and the opening and talked about where it came from the tradition of DWD it's kind of reminded me of being in those sessions and I really appreciated that whole uh, format and 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 some structure very simple structure to how the sessions would would be approached and 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 um, I was attracted to it even though DWD was sort of the the it's kind of landing zone. Uh, I quickly kind of went over the systems thinking just because I think I personally resonated more with that read a paper, discuss it kind of pattern a little bit um, and and was maybe a little more interested in the theoretical and 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 uh, um, and I guess my experience of learning about the things I learned about in the first sessions was, you know, it's uh, even though my you asked a bit about background, maybe, but um, my background had been in engineering type things, systems, so it was always a part of it from a technical standpoint. Um, it was just part of the picture uh, that you were dealing with that in uh, study and work. But um, I was really, uh, you know, the mind was expanded greatly with, with all the things we learned, you know, sitting around in that circle, I think, talking about um, the broader implications of systems. And it really st stuck in my mind. I think it's Gerald Midgley, is it the sort of critical, you know, boundary critique? Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, gonna check, check with people on that. <laughs> but uh, you know, that kind of extension of systems thinking into more of like an ethical or a, or a, a much more broadly conceived, much much be, well beyond any sort of technical system architecture or design or implementation type thinking, was really struck with stuck with me as well as uh, just uh, just how the, the 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 categories or the context or the application areas and domains of how systems thinking was what it was being drawn into was just uh, so broad that was really striking and so um, when you ask I'll, I'll pause now I guess but uh, just about organizing I think basically I, I'm I, I, when I first showed up and it was just the few of us and it, figure maybe you wonder like why I would show up and I was going to joke that I was sort of the substitute teacher who showed up when David went um 
went to do his PhD for a little while, basically. So um, that's sort of how I related to the organizing. It was sort of felt like sort of just filling in for a period of time um, uh, as, as as seemed necessary at the time. Uh, but I really enjoyed it and, and got into it and learned a, a, a quite a bit more and 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 in terms of uh attracting content or or people to speak yeah it was it was really uh um trying to keep i guess i was driven to keep extending and broadening that scope of application so anything like, like that's why we used to i remember joke at the introductions of the sessions about how uh, talk about anything <laughs> and like i think we joked at times like is there anything we don't talk about at systems thinking ontario is there anything that we don't try to look at or see or dis discuss or discover discern the the systems aspect or apply a systems thinking lens to or what have you right so so i kind of i guess tried to extend that and keep going so i was very open to anything and everything that um, came up and i remember organizing a few that that, that stretched that a bit um and those were really really fun so i don't know what else you asked but i tried to cover a bunch of stuff you Said. I can totally relate to the being a substitute because I find myself doing that now as Peter Jones has has gone to the Me Mexico and and uh, um, so I'm kind of co-organizing with David Ng these days. Um, Kelly, I do see your hand up, but I see Stephen Sillett's back. So I just want to maybe get him in and then we can go to you. Stephen Sillett, anything you want to share about the history of your interaction with Systems Thinking Ontario? But also recognizing that you've been close, uh, a close participant in designing with dialogue as well, which Systems Thinking Ontario was an offshoot of. If you're on the phone, Stephen, you're on mute. But I can I can prompt you to unmute. Maybe that's part of the uh, elusive nature of Stephen Sillett. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'm all guest. I'm uh, frantically trying to sort that out. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think I came to systems thinking after design with dialogue. And I'm trying to remember, I was interested in the papers and I had a broad interest in systems because I was following systems thinking through the LinkedIn group for a number of years that was kind of going on and had that forever question, what's a system? And that kept going backwards and forwards for a few years. And I think I was probably most interested in the human activity system kind of stuff. Um, and uh, <clears throat> my work, because it was coming from the a lot of work with participatory processes and what's it like to be inside. And so it's been interesting in a way seeing the journey and seeing actually some of David's work where he's gone into the ecological psychology and I sort of got into affordances through um, through my work with um, um, participatory mapping and then that sort of evolved and um, the complex adaptive system stuff has started to come in and um, I suppose more recently I've got more interested in agent-based approaches um, and exactly where does that fit in terms of it being a system versus maybe even something like VSM is kind of in this kind of in between. Uh, like what is a system starts to become a question because a system is something that's an idea, right, from the outside. So from the inside. So I, I'm quite interested in like flat ontologies now, like the idea of flat ontologies in geography where you don't necessarily have a hierarchy. So um, you're just in it, um, but then you sometimes still have to talk about it. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, I suppose I've come in from a methodological point of view and then been getting more and more into the systemic kind of approach. So um, fascinating. I'll pass it over to, to Kelly and many others that I know here, but Kelly has, has been talking to me in the past. So probably a good time to segue. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make the comment because we, we were talking about dialogue and one of the aspects that was somewhat different from Design with Dialogue and Systems Thinking Ontario was uh, the meetups after, uh, after the sessions. Uh, I think there was a number of times not coming from academia that um, I didn't quite understand or it wasn't of interest to me, but always, the meetups that we had afterwards, I could ask those more direct questions to the person that that was uh, 
that had introduced it or something that I didn't know. Or um, a lot of times the post session was much more interesting in terms of uh, the smaller group dialogues. Right, so the informal conversation after the event has wrapped where you go somewhere and have a bite or something provided a lot of like valuable learning experience just in that setting as an extension of it. Right, I mean, it may have depended on whether I did the reading or not. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I appreciate that, Kelly. That's a good point to add in in terms of the structure. I think we kind of missed that, that yes, there is an informal gathering afterwards. And as David was saying, like more readings might not help. Just having conversation does help. Um, I'm, I do have more probing questions I can ask some of the core group, but I'll, I'll pause for a second and just maybe ask anyone who hasn't shared or hasn't spoken uh, about it. Have there been any meetings that you've attended, Systems Thinking Ontario, or it could be DWD and that, you know, are there any remarkable or notable um, ones that you've attended that come to mind that you want to share or you want to reflect on? I will make a comment on uh, uh, if David Hawk wants to speak up, which is actually some topics I don't want to do. And entropy is one of them. And mm -hmm. so uh, when we went online um, because of COVID, uh, one of the opportunities was to reach outside of that and uh, invite people in. So uh, David Hawk is big on entropy. I am not. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? I can't see my image. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I found particularly interesting about the comments from the Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, there was a whole array of comments that focused on entropy as a way to finally understand climate change. And they had never thought of that. And they went into some detail on what they that meant. And in essence, my insult to humans by favoring negative entropy, they seem to appreciate a great deal. That I, I was sort of amazed that a, a strong cadre of those at that uh, book festival, uh, including a reviewer for New York Times books mm -hmm. and uh, other people like that, which wanted to go much deeper into that concept of entropy and climate change. Yeah. And particularly try and define <clears throat> my definition of negative entropy and how I make fun of humans and argue that at least 95% of TV ads, maybe 100, uh, are negative entropy that in essence lies. And so the idea that when you buy a car, it'll never need serviced, that you know at least it'll maintain itself. So go ahead, buy, 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 but in essence, Entropy works on everything, including the human body. And so, you know, unless you're immortal, you probably ought to notice entropy. Uh, certainly it will notice you. But I was quite amazed that the German meeting uh, went so deeply into that, whereas the uh, Filipino meeting uh, went so deeply into that swear word that I used in the title of the book. <laughs> and they wanted to know uh, why I did that and how I could do that, but they enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting, but I, I, I am getting further into entropy, David, with, with time, and it is uh, making more sense. And now I'm working on this book of uh, the six dimensions that people live in, A and in essence, entropy as the fourth dimension uh, is uh, terribly important. Uh, and that's, that's the masculine dimension. Uh, whereas the third dimension is nature, the feminine dimension. Mm -hmm. And so entropy is uh, becoming increasingly important for the crap that I talk about. But keep in mind, it is crap. <laughs> and uh, all that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David Hawk. Um, I think so there's there's subjects that you know that you guys touch on there's some that you want to lean into some that you don't david and you mentioned um actually I'll, I'll come to another point then we'll talk about the online era so you're it's 2013 all the way to 2019 you've done all this um well, sorry one of the things i was that came up 
in my own understanding of the history of systems thinking Ontario, because I only joined it when I started at OCAD SFI program, is that it touched on a number of schools, like there was an intersection it had with OCAD, but also U of T and York University. Do you maybe want to just expand a little bit about why that is a relevant point at Systems Thinking Ontario and how it interacts with other communities? Uh, yes. So this, this is associated with my claim that Toronto is a system thinking hub of the world and people don't really know about it. Um, because, um, so for those of you who are at OCAD University, uh, Peter Jones' um, knowledge of the history and uh, the theory of systems is really, really deep. Um, at the same time, we had at York University, the uh, Faculty of Environmental Studies, which actually should have been called System Studies, it would have been much clearer. Um, uh, and the work they did up there uh, and their PhD strong PhD program was very strong, uh, originally based off uh, the work of Eric Trist. Um, and then at University of Toronto, Steve Easterbrook um, had, was working on climate issues and systems thinking. Um, and this predates him actually, uh, uh, predates the School of the Environment that's actually now at uh, University of Toronto. So originally we had that crossover because the universities don't actually have much of an opportunity in Toronto to meet with each other. And it's something that we should actually probably regenerate. Sir, was there a naming challenge that was always the case? <laughs> like with System Thinking Ontario versus Toronto? Did that ever come up? Um, no, the reason we called System Thinking Ontario was that we thought we would actually uh, branch out and reach out to Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier University as well. And so yeah. this is in, in the context of having run the ISSS 2010 meeting at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, and uh, we had uh, Thomas Homer Dixon as one of our plenary speakers. Gotcha. Okay. I did not know that's why it's called Ontario. I generally was like, what was the, why, why decide the province level? Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so, and so you're, what's it like being able to maintain or how is it organized in such a way where you can maintain this happening every month? Was that exhaustive at times like David, Tim or others, or like, how did you kind of keep that going for so many years? Um, so for me, the meeting is actually more important than the topic most of the times, um, nice. and, and the opportunity of people to get together. And so, um, the, the thing that, um, I didn't want to have happen was me running all the sessions and picking all the topics, uh, which is why it was really good to have Tim for a period of time, uh, take that lead. Anything you want to expand on there, Tim? Uh, just that, just that. I guess it speaks to the fact that it um, was a really, like I said in earlier, really uh, valuable, meaningful kind of a monthly event um, that that had that, uh, you know, like Elena alluded to, kind of um, the comfort and security and familiarity of a monthly kind of uh, session and seeing this, the the group of people who would show up regularly again and again and and getting to have great discussions it was just fantastic discussion um and so for me it was sort of just a um matter of um you know um well this must continue <laughs> so so i just kept kind of doing some organizing in that and it was very informal i don't there was no formal handoff or anything david you did a few we would back and forth it for the few, first some and then and then you kind of got a little busy and so i'd do a bunch just kind of do a run of organizing and then you'd show up and have something new and then you came back i guess after formally finishing uh some of the schooling that was occupying your time and and got you know back into it more fully but yeah for me it was just a keeping it going and enjoying it myself so uh yeah um and uh i think i may i may the only thing i'll say is maybe i I might have gotten a little theoretical during my time. I might be the uh, stage of the academic uh, intensity a little bit. I don't know if people see it that way, but sometimes I wonder if that's how <laughs> I might, my, my little twist might have been a little bit maybe in, in the abstract. And and like I said earlier, trying to reach out and go everywhere with systems thinking a bit, you know. But, okay. Elena, you wanted to jump in here? Um I wanted to say there's no no risk of our running out of topics, right. um, either either through papers or through 
things that are coming up in the world. Um, and interestingly, some of the some of the papers and and theoreticians that we read who are no longer with us, uh, like Kenneth Boulding and Danella Meadows, are people who were very involved in sustainability and in respect for nature. And that seems to have been, you know, something that that showed up from the earliest um, earliest of our meetings. And I'm thinking of Kenneth Boulding, who back in, I think the late 80s, was at Waterloo uh, with Rob Hoffman and Bert McGinnis. Um, and Stafford and I were part of that discussion. But at that point, they had gathered together a group to talk about uh, the Brundtland Report and its implications. So the the focus and the interest in uh, sustainability and ecological considerations goes way back. Mm. Right. And so that's a continuous theme that you saw as valuable as having a continued conversation on. To yeah, the yeah, and not that every topic has to do with that, uh, but enough do. Right. Um, and sometimes we would have things that were more participative, like um, Aleko Christakis came through one year. Do you want to share a little bit about that? That actually sounds interesting. Well, I think it was when um, I think it was when we had the um, RSD in Toronto. Is he came through and did a session for Ontario Systems Group where he essentially led us in the, you know, kind of a, a demo version of the structured dialogic design, or now I think it's structured democratic design. At any rate, it, it keeps changing a little bit, but the focus remains the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that helps give a sense of the different types of topics. And as I understand, you even had sometimes a, a student might come and present their major research project, or you might have a guest visitor who's coming through the who's coming through town. Is there a sense of the breadth of topics, David, or anyone that you kind of like kind of comes to mind as to like what are the different focus areas that Systems Thinking Ontario would touch on? Uh, I'll just jump in and just say, uh, you know, of PASC and, and those folks and second order and the whole many orders of the systems thinking. So sort of, sort of scaling it in the, in the um, re-entrant kind of abstraction. And uh, um, also we had a, we had a counselor, a psychological counselor who showed up who had a systems thinking practice specifically, you know, that they, they, they studied and applied in their psychological counseling. And, um, and then um I, I guess biological, there was a lot of biological and, and, and sort of life sciences type, I think, sort of systems, things that, that came up as well as the social uh, systems and and almost political and the, and the boundary critique scope. So, yeah, I mean, and Alana, like, said it very well, never, never run out of topics. So, mm -hmm. sure, anyone could list five more things along that scope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um one thing I'd like to quickly add is that I found the student presentations of their projects to be very, very insightful and very inspiring of how far they'd been able to get using the tools. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, that's. I wish. <laughs> I wish Peter was on to hear that. But that's that's very, that's very glad to hear, especially coming from you, Lena. I, I think many of the students would really appreciate that, and that's why I think this meetup is so valuable as it is tied to the hip with OCAD, uh, even informally in some ways, it provides a great opportunity. I know that in the summer, for example, we uh, do something where we feature the synthesis maps that are produced in the semester in the spring. So it gives the students a chance to share it with an audience outside of their classmates. And that is always something we all appreciate in the systems community. So to to fast forward through time a little bit, we were you know we go through 2013 all the way up to 2019. Then uh, David, Ng, around this time, you are managing many of the systems thinking Ontario sessions, and COVID happens, and obviously there is a natural shift to going online. Was there any sessions online before that, and what was that shift like? 
And can you maybe share, and then the others can share about the pros and cons, which I, I feel like are common about in-person engagements and online. So, so Tim will actually remember some of my um, arguments about this before, because I really liked the format of meeting in a circle in person. Um, and my experience with hybrid conferences is that you either organize for the people that are in the room or you organize for the people who are online and you really can't do one or the other. And so I was pushing hard to keep System Thinking Ontario meeting in person um, with all of the uh, people in a circle. Um, Lambert Lounge used to be great for that. Um, and then uh, COVID happened. It's kind of like, well, that's not going to happen anymore. So we could meet online. Um, the shift was um, not that difficult, uh, really, because uh, we've, ha we've had a core group of people who have been coming regularly to the meetings. Um, so um, during COVID, uh, I thought it was a smooth transition over. And did that allow you to expand who you might invite as well? Like That's what I understand as well, based off of different people obviously connecting online, right? Yeah, so this overlapped also. Um, there, we had the, um, in 2019, in the beginning of 2019, we had started um, the System Changes Learning Circle. Um, and that was an offshoot from System Thinking Ontario. And so uh, I had proposed that um, when I was president of the ISSS in 2011, 2012, uh, my theme was rethinking systems thinking because I thought that much of system thinking is frozen in the 1980s and we need to progress beyond that. And so the advice I'd gotten, I spent uh, 20, 2014 to 2017 in the pattern language community. And the advice I got there was that if you want to actually make progress on something, you really need to do it locally. And so uh, it would have been in December, 2018, I actually proposed for, um, some people from System Thinking Ontario joined me on a separate project on System Changes Learning Circle and focus on that. And with that happening, uh, I also ended up teaching, um, the, the, the schedule was that uh, in uh, winter of 2020, um, Peter was teaching the Understanding Systems course and Jeremy Bowes usually teaches half the course went on sabbatical. So we, uh, I, I taught that with uh, Lorraine and Peter um, and so that kind of energized um, all of the discussions around uh, around larger topics, particularly a turn towards systems changes from system thinking and, and what the difference was. Um, but when that happened, uh, we we had, in effect, a group of people that have been coming regularly um, and just moving them online. Um, I think they welcomed it. In COVID, I think that uh, the with people all shut in together, maybe that was an opportunity for people to blow off some steam. Right. Maybe I'll just open that generally to everyone on the call, not, not necessarily the main panelists here, but does anyone have any reflections, thoughts, or comments about your own experiences around convening around the topic of systems online uh, versus perhaps when you may have done it in certain communities or smaller circles in person? What are some of the trade-offs that you valued or any any comments or thoughts about that? I'm just going to say, if I think about missing the people, many of whom are here, mm -hmm. I only think of the in-person. I, I don't, my memory of that emotion or feeling is not, I don't, I don't picture the screen and the squares. Right. I picture being in Lambert Lounge, talking in person, walking across the foyer, yeah. Right, right. Anyone else have any experiences, even if it's not in Systems Thinking Ontario, any other reflections that you might have about the benefits and challenges of convening around systems online versus in person? Sure, Kelly. I mean, as far as trade-offs go, the you ju you just dropped some links that would have been more difficult in person. They could have been written down, but it, it's certainly an easy grab for something as simple as that. Um, the, the other opportunity when we went online was to expand it to uh, a much broader audience that uh, they weren't just passing through. But for example, with David Hawk on the call uh, right now, uh, uh, I don't know that I would have had that opportunity had we kept it to a local uh, meetup. Right. But I do like the meetups as well. 
I was disappointed that we, this one wasn't at uh, the Center for Social Innovation. <laughs> I see that we have, I'm not gonna try not to put you only on the spot, but Stephen Davies, welcome. Thank you for joining. We were doing it, we were chatting with a little bit of the folks who've been long, long standing either participants or organizers. And I was wondering, maybe Stephen, just to give you the microphone, if you want to share your experience of how you got into systems and particularly systems thinking Ontario as a meetup and what value that's provided you. Hmm. Thanks for the invitation, uh, Zad. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, my introduction to systems was through mathematics. Um, I did a, an undergraduate degree in mathematics, looking at systems of partial differential equations in three variables and solving uh, those systems of equations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Solving them usually meant that we were given a set of initial conditions and a set of boundary conditions. And solving it usually meant, you know, either finding local minima or local maxima of the function of the function uh, across a three three dimensional space. Um, and so that I mean that was all all very well and good, you know, when you're solving physics problems. Or when you were um, when you're able to translate uh, a challenge into a mathematical system of equations, um, and then I graduated in 1986, and I didn't read a book for three years. I was in uh, I was literally traumatized by my degree. Um, it was uh, a really intense experience, and then I made the mistake of picking up the book called Chaos in 1989. And um, in that book, I learned that my university degree covered about 3% of real world problems. Those that could actually be expressed in uh, mathematical equations that could be solved. And I mean, it's useful for control theory and control systems and everything else. But <clears throat> that was my introduction to open systems and to uh, sim systems that had simple feedback that had fractal dimensions on those feedback loops. And that really launched me into, into uh, a, a meaningful inquiry into what does it mean to live in an open system? Um, I was then blessed in 1993 or 92 to be introduced to Elena's partner, Stafford Beer. And um, while most people think that that introduction might mean VSM, for me, it did not. It meant Teams Integrity. And so I love Teams Integrity from the get-go because the, the geometry of the icosahedron was a highly symmetrical system. There's 120 degrees of symmetry in an icosahedron. And when I looked at the protocol that Stafford had invented, for creating non-hierarchical ways of convening and having dialogue, uh, I was blown away. Uh, I spent the next four or five years um, delivering syntegrations across the world. Um, I've delivered syntegrations on five continents um, over probably over 85 or 90 syntegrations. Um, and so for me, that actually moved me. I mean, as a system, as a system for convening and a system for dialogue, and as a system for allowing for the emergence of group coherence and group cohesion and community, I mean, I, I, I found nothing else that even compares. Um, it is it is the most powerful social technology I think I've ever I've ever used, and it's in person and it's best in person. And so um, when STO first arose, I was intrigued because I think that was during my first, uh, that was while I was teaching at OCAD and obviously Peter was involved. And, and so I was intrigued by the possibilities. Um, and it's funny because David and I were just, we had, we had tea at my place on Thursday afternoon and David 
explain to me what the transition was into STO from Design with Dialogue, which obviously was the series of conversations that uh, Peter had um, hosted and facilitated for, for, for years, long before I joined uh, OCAD. Um, and David helped me understand how the transition, what that transition was was intended to do. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think, you know, there's no substitute for meeting in person. I mean, uh, I love the fact that we're meeting tonight on Zoom because I had family commitments that kept me until about 7.15. And I was only able to, I was able to, but now I'm able to join. Whereas if I had tried to travel down to the Lambert Lounge, I would be arriving at the end of the session. So um, it's hard to fault the virtual forms of engaging um, because they are so enabling. And, and I get to see your face and Kelly's face and Cheryl and Elena and, and David, you're all here. And uh, Stephen Sillette, I haven't seen Stephen Sillette in, in, mm, almost two years. So I welcome him and Tim as well. Tim, it was great to see your face on here. Um, so, so I don't think I've answered the question other than to say that, you know, th there is no substitute for face-to-face -face engagement. Mm -hmm. You know, the words are, the words are great you know, and we can speak to one another, but there's so much, in a field, if you can create a field, a, a vibrational field that is then inductive, um, it's just so much more powerful than doing it online. I, I've seen it done online it, with very careful facilitation, but it still doesn't have the power of in-person. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my thoughts on the in on online versus in-person. And just generally, I hear David's call for renewal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think David's call for renewal is an important call. I really love the fact that he's he's sounding that call um, because it really it really forces us to to get over ourselves and say, well, what are we going to do next, people? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you, 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 you answered a bunch of questions well, well, even poetically well forming them. So I appreciate that, Stephen Davies. And I think there's a couple of themes that show up throughout the conversation that we've had even prior to you joining, but even in those comments about almost this group being a manifestation of an open system, of a living system that has transitionary stages and it has interweaves and it has knots in the David Ng metaphor that he describes systems as weaving through time. And so it's quite interesting to then, yes, recognize the challenges and the affordances of the online versus in person, which you know challenges us when we can't be together and, and what limitations that provides and the affordances that it opens up in terms of breadth and scale and who can and can't be involved uh, for convenience factors. So I think that's well noted and those are some of the themes that I'm noticing. I'll 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 actually or sorry Tim were you gonna say were you gonna jump in? I was just gonna say I think I think someone asked about flat ontology and I think I think the spirit of what you just articulated off the back of what Stephen was expressing about in person is almost like maybe a feeling into what is meant by flat ontology. And the metaphor that came to mind, uh, I didn't venture to throw it in the chat because, you know, it would be nonsensical, I suppose, just randomly by itself. But the metaphor, now that I'm putting it in context, that I, that I was sort of wanted to throw in there was sort of uh, flat ontology is sort of like the algal mat of the mm -hmm. real systems, you know, when everything is all there, it's all there, which is kind of what Stephen, I think, is pointing to as a distinction there. So no big, you know, just as an aside that right. the content and the context and everything you were just saying and how you just put it all together. I think that's what is being sought or reached towards by flat ontology that came up earlier. And I think uh, actor network theory was one example when I tried to look up a reference and also Deleuze and Thousand Plateaus and and those folks trying to just grapple with the uh, in it, the, the, the in itness, the kind of that's <laughs> that's the spirit of that flat ontology but yeah i just wanted to take the opportunity because it seemed that's sure. next. yeah i appreciate that I, and i think i've been kind of chatting and just asking questions so far in my role as moderator but i'm gonna 
slightly shift the conversation and wear a little bit of a different hat as speaking about um, last year, was it, that Peter Jones had, um, you know, he had since moved to Mexico to teach at the, at the Monterey Tech. And so that left a space in terms of the organizing that Tim, Tim Lloyd referred to as the substitute role. So here I have raised my hand, perhaps involuntarily even, um, and being on that. And when we talk about rethinking systems thinking, I'll, I'll share my approach, my perspective, and I would love to hear what others think. But oftentimes, as someone who's a little bit more on the novice side of systems thinking back in 2016, 17, when I started at OCAD, um, I would start to see a lot of the conversation become insular and it became not necessarily only in a critical way, but insular in that there's often this term, whether people refer to themselves as systems thinkers or not, but that that term had to be there in order for that conversation perhaps to be fully animated. And I was kind of challenging that about thinking about what can we learn from other topics as systems thinkers, rather than what can we learn from systems thinkers? Because I think that embrace a lot of the sweeping in perspective of multi-perspective inquiry. And so having the reins and having David and I as co-organizers, I put on a bunch of series last year or earlier this year, that'll even continue um, about what can systems thinkers learn from X and you know, insert topic here. And so it was kind of a spiritual successor to what Tim and Elena were talking about, about no shortage of topics. And we've talked about video game design. We've talked about music cities. We've talked about um, evaluation. So all types of different topics without centering systems thinking so, so much as a focal point. Um, poetry, civic tech. Yes, we had a civic tech episode. Um, and so that's that's kind of the path that I've been inheriting Systems Thinking Ontario on. I also want to be respectful of the tradition. And that tradition means being able to return to in-person. Yes, Kelly, so we will be returning to in-person, but also opening up the affordances to doing online when, when we need to. Um, I don't know if anyone has a comment around, especially those who've been in the system thinking communities for a long time, where do you find the challenges and benefits of learning from topics that are not self-described as systems thinking. Is that resonating with anyone? Am I onto something? Or do you, you know, how do you kind of filter what you kind of take in through that lens when you try to interpret it from a systems perspective? I'd love to hear from anyone. Jessica, yes, Jessica, we haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> Um, I think that's one of the things that I really do enjoy coming to Systems Thinking Ontario. Um, back then, I think, you know, it, David touched on earlier about, you know, the the known and unknowns. I don't know, I don't know what I don't know. And uh, I'm not sort of, um, uh, especially in those times when I first started, you know, coming across to Systems Thinking Ontario, and I really... I mean, I don't know a lot of things now still, but I know less than, <laughs> and uh, that really helped me to sort of uh, open my eyes to different topics and different ways of um, perspective of looking at things and um, and just seeing the conversation that we had earlier on and with people sort of commenting on sort of the, um, you know, what is the example of that? What example of that? It helps me to sort of um, um, understand some of the concept that I could take from the readings, but not quite really understanding um, what it means in, in embodiment. And, and so, so I do appreciate that. So the diversity of um, topics that we, we can touch on. Um, with that, and I think um, we still need to have that uh, you know, taking it for the grain of thought that, you know, system thinking, it, it is a, it is a way of looking at something, but maybe not the only way and, and then to leave room for that. And then I think that's also um, something that I'm, I'm learning along, <laughs> along the way as well. And um, to, to appreciate that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's something I really do appreciate. And, um, and then sort of commenting on the in-person, um, um, versus online, um, 
and those I, I live in Mississauga at that time and so coming to Toronto to meet to 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 the in-person meeting was always a challenge so I feel like I'm always the one that was late to the meeting I miss the introduction so sort of, but and you know well forever the little time that I have um that do make it in in that period of time and I really do appreciate the richness um of that conversation or even the tension that sometimes takes on from the subjects because that um you know it, it's hard to sort of um to curate those different topics and different you know um on your own in a sense and so to learning from different people and different perspective um and the different background that people bring in is definitely something that i um, really do appreciate and um and you know and the, the fact that it's online now that i could tap in whenever i have the time for and that's that's also very you know it's great because then i feel like i have this group of people in this place where i can you know, always sort of count on to to say oh hey you know what new things I should be learning now or what's going on now and I should you know sort of um you know put my thinking cap on and and so um so I, I yeah and I do appreciate um all the um sort of the the mentoring that David and Elena and, and Kelly and, and Tim and like everyone who was involved in um and through that time and 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 so I think uh, for me, it, it um, that um, that sense of oh, this is a place where I can go to. Um, I I don't know how it would have been developed if it just started from the online platform. And I feel um, it, because I have you know went into that in person meeting, and I feel like oh, hey, this is some something familiar I can tap into. Um, but um, and that's how I feel. But uh, you know. Not speaking to to about everyone. I think that's a good point that maybe goes underscored is the order in which there was relationships built offline that could then be semi translated into an online setting versus had it gone another way it might not be as you know energized and and, and so that's a valid point. I also like your point, Jessica, about the tension between curating systems, which is extremely challenging, but also deriving meaning from a systems concept from a, no a number of different reference points, which is why the endless stream of topics can actually be helpful in a way, because you can understand something from topic X, Y, and Z, uh, even though it's the same concept. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Is there anyone else, uh, any other reflections on, on this notion of, um, yeah, parent? Hi. Um, so yeah, as I said, I um I study sort of sustainability transition. And I would say, and within my work, I um I talk about exactly this. So I appreciate you raising it. Um, the idea that, you know, really sort of complex global challenges, they're um they're giving us kind of this subject of analysis by which to understand sort of systems and complex systems in more nuanced ways. Um, and they're sort of um, raising the imperative to do so and to kind of ex expand um, thinking in those areas, um, both in concepts and methods and how we apply them, um, again, to kind of engage with critical challenges. So you're so you're saying this the sustainability one is like a, is an, analogous for you like there's a demonstration of which that community has a similar way of referring to different topics to make their subject more understandable. What I'm saying is that um it's sort of it it the problems sort of necessitate the lens right. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Yeah, and it has actually, and I I mean in my own work I talk about how um you know, the two, the two sort of fields, sustainability and complex systems thinking, as well as systems thinking have kind of evolved together in many ways. Um, and it is sort of, and it, and, and they do certainly evolve through, well, and resilience thinking is sort of the center point for that, um, where you see kind of um, sort of sustainability with complexity kind of applied together in, in lots of different contexts, um, you know, mm -hmm. environmental and social. And how would you describe that evolution, by the way, in your words? How do I describe it? How, how would you describe the evolution of sustainability and complexity together? Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, I, I actually do study it over, like, as it sort of has been unfolding over the course of a number of different fields. So, for example, you can see it in ecological economics. You can see it in planetary health, global governance, um, as I said, resilience, um, even, like, restoration ecology. 
Um, and so you see, you sort of see each of these fields sort of understanding, um, like all of them are sort of coming to terms with the fact that, you know, their field or the subject of study is more complex than what was originally, um, you know, indicated that, I mean, that's especially the case, for example, in resilience and ecological restoration, where you see, um, you know, sort of ecosystems going through fluctuations over time, and we've had to kind of learn to kind of manage for that. Um, and then the management, you know, sort of the adaptive planning, um, you know, that that was something that was introduced, you know, sort of early on, but then, you know, like the management, the monitoring and analysis tools become sort of more sophisticated over time. So. Gotcha. Yeah, very well said. Thank you. Maybe I'll I'll offer another prompt to the group as we're kind of at the 10 minutes to the hour, we could kind of wind down or or slowly bring it down. But I was wondering, are there any memorable um, systems thinking Ontario sessions that you've had that have either left a mark on your understanding, um, ones that stuck in your head? Are there is there any kind of this is this is the chance where we get to go down memory lane basically for for a few minutes. I was wondering if if anyone around the room wants to share any memorable um, ones. I'll I'll actually start. There's something that always stood out to me, and it was and I I re met him again. It was David um David uh, Mallory was sharing a little bit of, about his work out of York University, and he was the first that was introducing concepts of um uh, Rosen Robert Rosen and the metaphor. And I, I, this was early in my years of trying to grasp systems thinking, so I didn't have a strong handle on it, but he really used that example of uh, in which anticipatory system, living systems have a built-in capacity to anticipate and that the trees would anticipate the reduction of sunlight, which would then transfer the energy away from their, uh, they would start harnessing the energy, which is why the leaves would turn color. And so it was a coupling of this living system with its environment and it had an inherent thing. So just the idea that like, it kind of messes the causality in your head why, why you might think, oh, the seasons change, the leaves change color, but there was a little bit of a bigger picture. That stood out to me, perhaps also because it was one of the earlier ones that I attended, but that's my little systems thinking Ontario memory as I always remember the, the anecdote about the leaves changing color and what's really going on behind that. One of the things that we used to do was um, have summer conference debriefings um, because we used to go to the systems conferences and we come back. And I'm not sure if we actually need those anymore because um, the volume of content on YouTube these days is so large. Um, but uh, a lot of the stuff has been done online now. So uh, during COVID, the ISSS actually moved the conferences online and they've been running hybrid conferences. So um I don't know if we do or don't need those discussions anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, to be determined, right? I guess I guess that's a second order effect of others going online in addition to everyone being affected by online is the sheer amount of content now available. And that's also poses its own challenges of how you filter all of that. But yeah, that's a good point about those debrief sessions. Kelly, did you have a, a memory, a Systems Think Ontario memory you wanted to share? Yeah, it's actually not a memory, but uh, because this is being recorded, and and I just, um, I just wanted to say, as somebody who is coming in extremely new uh, to systems, I I didn't know that systems was a science. Never mind that there were different branches. I, I remember thinking, how did I become a cybernetic uh, into cybernetics or into physics? I would really encourage anybody who is. Uh, seeing this recording to that it's a really welcoming uh group for open learning and i and i'm really grateful for the community to have welcomed me in and not um i don't know uh been dismissive or otherwise that that i didn't know anything <laughs> but i certainly appreciate uh having learned from the group thank you kelly i appreciate it Elena, you wanted to share something? Well, I think one thing 
building on what Kelly says is none of us know the whole systems field. Mm. And so we can all learn, uh, but we can, we all also have big gaps in our knowledge about what we know about in the systems field, what we're familiar with and don't really understand that well, and what we simply are clueless about. Um, and I think for that reason, um, that sometimes having the conference debrief, uh, it may not have to be the whole meeting, but I think it's helpful to kind of give people a little bit of, of uh, signal about what else is going on in the field that maybe will be relevant to them or maybe not. Yeah, and that connects back to the point that David Ng mentioned in that opening about the map of ignorance and unknown unknowns and what we may or may not know. I think it's a valuable point. I, I really appreciated those. I'll just, since it came up, Elena, I don't know if, uh, if we're, that's, I don't know if that was the topic of discussion, but those, those debriefs from the conference, I really, that was a way for me to learn about something that was happening far away and I wasn't there and I was really interested in all the topics. And if I could have, I would have been at all of them, you know? Um, so I, you know, you may have recalled, I might've been someone who was saying, Hey, let's put the debrief in. Oh, the debrief should be, <laughs> you know, because it was meaningful to me for sure. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, but I understand where you come from, David, yeah, to the, to the point of practicality and availability of online resources. Now everyone can catch themselves up quite high fidelity on, on an event like that. Uh, the only, the only thing I'll add to like um, meaningful things is we did, I, I still have this bottle that we shared one time to remember Sean. Uh, mm. <laughs> Yeah, who was a, an early contributor to the group who was quite involved. And I remember I organized a session with him at one point. And then the subject matter of that was something that was really interesting uh, to me as well. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's some and many, many meaningful topics. And David Mallory comes to mind as well for me. That And uh, yeah. somehow that session ended up, I think, being a reason why I ended up organizing something with Peter Victor, which I also found is a really kind of meaningful activity around the, the um, degrowth kind of movement and it just released a book so mm -hmm. the whole connection with uh, is it york i guess is environmental <clears throat> program and and the folks who started to show up from there that really added a lot of energy and really rich content around the environmental and ecological systems thinking and all of that mm -hmm. it looks like uh we'll go stephen davies and then maybe david hawk if he's up next but yeah stephen and then david sure yeah, um, <clears throat> just to build off the, the York connection, I remember the ecological economics folks coming in one time and one of the graduate students positing the question um, of whether or not the climate crisis was an expression of our fear of death. And I, I, I just, I thought that was one of the most insightful um comments that I'd heard at Systems Thinking Ontario in a long time, but that's, I'm just trying to build off what Tim shared. Um, what I was going to offer was a, a memorable session uh, with Anthony Hodgson. Um, going back a few years now, could be, could be 2015, 2016, maybe later. Uh, Anthony associated with obviously the International Futures Forum uh was uh introduced the world system model to us and then we actually played a version of the world game that anthony uh was had, had gamified and and i don't know i can see some smiles i see kelly smiling i think kelly may, might have been there and maybe some others but th that was a memorable session i thought you know it it was an abbreviated version of the world game you know we only had a little bit of time but mm. i thought <laughs> tim says we won it <laughs> Okay, that's the end of that story. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Um, David Hawk, you wanted to sure. share? If I, yeah, if I might confuse things a little bit, um, uh, might be worth noting that my introduction to a systems language began with a course I took from the Dean of Electrical Engineering, University of Pennsylvania, uh, he was one of the developers of holography way back when, uh, along with the person that actually developed it. He was something like his assistant and had this passion for holography. So he offered a course, which I took, 
and that was an amazing course. And he talked quite a bit about the basis for system sciences. And in fact, when the ACOF program was closed down, it was sent back to him. But in essence, that program then went back where it more or less began in engineering and under the directorship of this gentleman. But his uh, work, and he had a couple of systems people, shall we say a couple of the gurus, I forget their names, but <laughs> the ones that wrote lots of stuff that was talked about at the conferences, uh, came and helped him teach that course. Uh, I think not very well, but he taught it masterfully. And the idea of how to uh, get beyond two dimensions was really crucial for him and how to get humans out of a two-dimensional rut or whatever you'd like to call it. And uh, so this work I'm about to go deeper into relative to system science on dimensionality comes very much out of his work and very much out of holography. And it just happens that I have a uh, daughter who works for um, Apple in their artificial intelligence network. And she just got, what, after three months, her second promotion. And so she's taking over management of one of the new areas for artificial intelligence. And holography is very important for she. Otherwise, I'll disown her. But nonetheless, <laughs> she's trying to make more sense of communication vis-a-vis -vis AI, vis-a-vis -vis including holography in the process. And so I think we have a interesting future relative to that. And I mean, I've talked about this with David Ng before, but the sort of six dimensions that people find themselves in uh, begins with zero. <laughs> and as you probably all know, if you've studied any math, zero is a point. And so people that are standing on a point and nothing else are pretty predictable. Uh, in essence, that's most politicians in most countries. Uh, people that have made it to a one-dimensional, in essence, are the people that are on a seesaw or uh, trying to figure out which part of the uh, digital they're in. So are you into entropy or negative entropy? And a lot of system science people are into negative entropy. That I've gone through much of the literature and pulled out the paragraphs where they argued for negative entropy. And unfortunately, they were wrong because they all died. And I somehow was hoping they were right, but they did pass on, there were funerals. So obviously they lost that bet. <clears throat> and then of course we have uh, the second dimension, <clears throat> which is the major, the major problem of all of us, particularly lawyers. This is the reason why lawyers, uh, I put in a very special bad category because almost everything they do is based on two-dimensional paper. They, in essence, cannot get beyond the paper. And also an awful lot of academics suffer from the same problem, the same limitation. <clears throat> but most youth that have a cell phone have developing are developing the same problem. They're locked into two dimensions. And grandpa that sits and watches, shall we say, a movies all night on his TV is also locked in two dimensions. So in essence, the majority of humans do not make it beyond the second dimension. And so in essence, how systems thinking would get people to think about more than that is the agenda I'm now working on. And so I'm doing a chart of how to put people in a predict, how to predict the category they're in based on about five minutes discussion and which of the dimensions they favor or are locked in. And of course, I won't go into it, but the fifth dimension is um, of course my hero. So the fifth dimension, <laughs> is well beyond all oh, these, anyway, uh, is well beyond human limitations. But in essence, uh, increasingly I've been telling children 
they really understand want to understand the fifth dimension listen to the various uh, versions of hallelujah eventually you'll get it and so for me hallelujah is a good access point to get to the fifth dimension uh it may well be spiritual um but it is not religious because all religions have hierarchy and the fifth dimension has no hierarchy it does not allow hierarchy it's much like nature humans like hierarchy because they're lazy but the fifth dimension doesn't allow that crap so at some point the systems people i, I think will find this dimensionality somewhat helpful and it began in a funny course on holography back in 1972. And I appreciate very much that Dean that taught that course. Yeah, sounds like we have a, a topic for a future systems thinking session around the fifth dimension. Thank you. Thank you, David Hawk. Um, yeah, as we're winding down, is there anyone else that wants to, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, who wants to share um, if you had a memorable system thinking Ontario session or, or anything related to what we've been chatted about today as we wind down? Well, this is the part where then we would normally go for, what is it, David, like Thai Vietnamese food across the street? Um, I don't believe we can pull that off digitally, but um, you know, we'll see once David Hawk's daughter works on some AI that might help us do that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining the session. Really appreciated it. I know this was on an evening where there was a number of RSD sessions beforehand, so I know, Cheryl May, your battery is probably at low or negative entropy even. Um, but I appreciate you all coming out tonight and sticking with this. Um, we will next month. This one was a feature from RSD, so we were happy to be online and interact with the wider audience, which was fantastic. Uh, next month, I'll just give you the heads up. I haven't written it online, but we are going to be in person. We will be talking. Um, actually, it's a topic that's come up before, but it's about what can systems thinkers uh, learn from grief or grieving practices. And it's some of my associates and OCAD U who've done an installation at Evergreen. So we may both interact with that and talk through that as we interact with that experience. So that will be um, uh, coincidentally on Monday, November 11th as well, which is Remembrance Day um, for, the, for, for those in Canada here. So yeah, with that, um, I'll get that posted online and shared out. And, and then we're off for December. We usually have that one as just a quiet month when people are recouping. And then in the new year, we may oscillate. We may do a month in person, a month online, or we may flip it around depending on season and availability. So thank you so much. Um, you can definitely find out more on the Systems Thinking Ontario website. There's also a, a notice board as well that we kind of post to. And looking forward to having you all on the next one. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Is there time for me to make a short announcement? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Just thank you, everyone. It's it's wonderful to wrap up what has been uh, months and months and months of work with a final session here on your 125th meeting, which is indeed an inspiration. Uh, so just wanted to, to note that, that this is the last formal session of the online. So, I mean, I could talk for hours about online versus in-person and all of the components of that, but I won't. Uh, but I will say that uh, it looks like we have RSD 14 in Toronto next year. Uh, the new Dean of OCAD, Leslie Ann Noel, has enthusiastically embraced that idea. Um, and we had RSD 12 last year. So I know some of you, Kelly, you were there. Um, and um, that was that was a good event. We had 100, 150 or so people enrolled, uh, signed up to do that. We've had um, this year, we've had 1200, over 1200 people online. So interesting how, you know, the online space, uh, you know, creates this opportunity for a festival, which is, which is fun. Uh, but I just wanted to put that in everyone's 
diary that next October it looks like will be Toronto. And um, obviously we'll be drawing. <laughs> I know, good, Alana will get to meet. Um, <laughs> um, and obviously we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, talking throughout the year. Um, this comes out of some work I did all year on uh, adjacency. Uh, so I was experimenting with the potential of adjacency to uh, build build communities and support transdisciplinary work. So that was the uh, that's the inspiration for this. And Zaid came in very gamely to um, to to be our current sin systems thinking. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're very welcome. That's yeah. super exciting. I think I think that presents a real opportunity. Uh, when we're all together and obviously doing it in Toronto is going to be really ripe uh, for connecting in person and bringing all the best. Sorry, Elena, you're about to say something as well. No, I just wanted to say thank you and looking forward to RSD being in Toronto. Yeah, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, have a great night, everyone. Take care. Be well. Bye now.